Well, hello and welcome to Explore Classroom. My name is Celeste Harrison and I'm so happy to have you joining us today. Here at National Geographic, we believe in the power of exploration and wonder and science and storytelling to change our world for the better. This Explorer Classroom YouTube show connects students from all around the world with our National Geographic Explorers for short lessons and plenty of time for all of your questions. Today, we're coming to you with a special event. We've got Zaleka Philander, a wonderful marine biologist on board the Ocean Explorer, which is this very state-of-the-art research vessel currently floating at sea kind of near the Dominican Republic. And Zaleka is a South African marine biologist with a background in marine taxonomy and a deep interest in deep sea research. Zaleka is also an active science communicator and has started a mentorship program focused on creating more opportunities for the next generation of scientists. She's received a whole number of different awards in recognition of all of her efforts to transform marine sciences in South Africa. And like I said, she's currently on board the Ocean Explorer with scientists and technologists from all around the world. They're out on a mission to explore some of the most remote parts of our ocean and share what they find with students like you and the general public. So today we're gonna to digitally climb aboard the Ocean Explorer. I can't wait. And we're gonna learn all about Zaleka's work and even tour the ROV deck and mission control with her. I cannot wait to dig in, but before we do, I do wanna acknowledge all of the great students we have joining us from around the world. Today, our students are representing South Carolina, Ontario, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, California, Illinois, Indiana, the District of Columbia, Vermont, Pennsylvania, South Africa, the Czech Republic, Bermuda, Hong Kong, England, Wales, Jersey, Ireland. I've got some shout outs to give. So shout outs to Styles Point Elementary, St. Bastina, March Academy, HWCDSB Virtual, St. Bernard's, St. John's, Grundy Avenue Elementary, Pine Valley, Montclair, Joyce Kilmer Middle School, Asbury Park, Hawes Elementary, Veterans Memorial, Del Rey Students, St. Helier, Gordon Road Girls School, Kuro Edenvale, Hong Kong International School, Access Habitable Planet, the Beach Co-op in Cape Town, St. David's, Guardians of the Reef in Pembroke, Two Oceans Aquarium, Kamatij Primary, Simons Town School, and CSIR. I'm thrilled to have all of you here with us. And with that introduction out of our way, let's get this Explorer Classroom started. I'm gonna turn it over to Zaleka uh, to share about her work, show us around and take a look at all the tools she's using to see the seafloor. Take it away. Hi everyone. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited to be like chatting to you guys today. Can you tell how excited I am? OMG. Um, so yeah, as Celeste has mentioned, I am part of a team of researchers who are out on the ex ocean explorer and we're trying to document and better understand the northern parts of our ocean. Um, yeah, this is possibly the longest I have been away from home. And although I really miss my son and husband, this has come with an opportunity for me to actually see some parts of our ocean that nobody has ever set eyes on. Uh, but before I share that, uh, some of these areas that we have seen, I would like to introduce the robot of the hour. Um, this is like the most amazing tool on board. And it gives us an opportunity to set eyes on these deeper sort of like these ecosystems and areas. Um, and like any other vehicle or motor vehicle, it has uh, different specialized components that help the robot function as one. Um, but yeah, any other, it's quite massive. It's really big, as big as I dare say an SUV or small truck. And uh, we have a number of uh, ROV pilots who help us with ensuring that we can document what we need to document. And they sort of like understand the system from its tiny bolts to how it has to actually move in the water. Talking about which, I'm just gonna walk to the back of our sub hangar where I have one of our ROV pilots, Ewan. It's quite big. Ewan, say hi. Hello. How's it going? So what are you doing? Um, I am fixing our suction sampler 
at the moment, which has uh, grease in the bearings and stuff like that. Did a bit of maintenance while the ROV is on deck, keeping it running smoothly. Super. Thank you, Yuan. Yeah, one thing I forgot to mention is that the ROV can actually pick and choose different tools uh, that we might need on any sort of like mission or objective. Uh, and Yuan is sort of like looking at one of those right now. But any robot, any motor vehicle is only as good as the people who actually operate it. And uh, so the robot, the robot, the ROV, maintains communication with our ROV pilots through a cable that is beautifully folded in that blue uh, sort of like structure, which we call a winch. And all this information is then transferred into mission control. And that's where I'm gonna take you guys quickly. This is also, I dare say, one of the most busiest uh, rooms on the vessel. This is where you generally find myself and other scientists, uh, you know, like viewing and waiting eagerly to see what the ocean is going to reveal to us. And a general day or a normal day of operations, I sit right behind the ROV pilots, where I sort of like document all observations as we get into the water. Uh, but today I am going to treat myself, Logan, can you just hold that? I'm going to treat myself to sitting on the ROV pilot seat. which is very, very comfortable, I must say. Uh, and it's like fitted with different bolts, uh, buttons. Uh, there's a joystick, there's several screens in front of it. Um, and this basically ensures that the ROV pilots can maintain communication with the robot. Uh, all this information, once again, is fed through this very specialized cable. And luckily for the ROV pilots, they sort of understand robot language, which I don't. So this is... It's a team effort, so the ROV pilots have to maintain communication with the robot, but they also need to maintain communication with the captain, the captain who is steering and driving this research vessel. There's also another component to uh, communication, and that's with the researchers on board. I try not to distract the pilots uh, as much as I can, but we sometimes also have to communicate in terms of what samples I need, uh, which track to take, etc. So yeah, um, Celeste, are you gonna play the video quickly? I'm gonna take you, uh, I'm gonna share a short clip that Celeste is gonna play that basically brings together some of the exciting sort of areas that we have seen. Uh, the one thing you need to remember is that the ocean uh, operates on different rules. So instead of like being separated by continents, uh, provinces or states, or, or a house being separated by a fence or a road, the ocean and the animals that live in the ocean uh, are separated based on how cold or warm the water is, how fast the water is moving, um, and light intensity. So light can only travel to a certain distance in the ocean space. And one of the most exciting parts that I'm really interested in is the sediment. So what makes, uh, what, what makes uh, these houses that these animals and sometimes plants live in? And what you see in front of you is an example of a shallow water system where we see sandy pits and we have rocky outcrops. You sometimes have a mosaic, so a combination of two. And there's a lot of clues in these sediments. Uh, for example, as you can see, there's like uh, some patterns, some very natural patterns. They can give us a sense of how fast the water is moving above the sea bottom. So all of these systems come with a, a suit of communities, animals uh, that interact with one another and try and ensure that the ocean functions as best as it can. Um, one of the exciting things of the ROV beyond just being our eyes is that it can sample things, it can pick and choose. So imagine doing your shopping with uh, your parents in a superstore. You just take whatever you want to do in a very delicate manner without having to disrupt anything. So we have different forms of sampling. We sample rocks, we can also sample sand. And as I've mentioned, one of my interests is finding these clues in the very small set grain sizes. Uh, we also have rocks, we have clips, we have clips that uh, sort of like play as a protection for some of these fish and animals. Uh, and they're also like, they also have like quite a specialized set of animals, uh, like what you're seeing right now, it's like a root-like structure, but that's actually an animal. 
We have these slopey sandy bits where we find worm-like structures that we have no idea what they are, but uh, we get a sense of what role they play ecologically. So they burrow and you can't, uh, you know, you, 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 from this burrowing, you can get a sense of what role the animal plays. Um, so this is just an example of some of the burrowing tracks that are left behind by some of these animals. We also get crabs, massive crabs that go on their expeditions of their own and sort of like feed as they're walking around on these very slopey areas. So all of these animals have actually evolved ways and adapted to live in these environments, such as this fish where their pectoral fins have sort of moved forward because they don't actually have to swim in the water column, they just sit and wait uh, and maximize their environment. So this is also very exciting, especially when you look at your own body, you have hands, you have fingers, you have feet, you have toes, and all of these help you to be able to walk, to balance and to be within the environment. This is no different to some of the amazing animals such as the skull crinoid, which is a primitive animal closely related to sea stars, um, um, sea stars and sea urchins. Uh, this is also one of the animals that are actually related to echinoderms. It's a, a pelagic sea cucumber. And as you can see, it's maximizing its time in its environment and it's actually gliding along with the currents. You also see some particles like sandy snow. And this is what actually powers most of the systems at these deeper waters. Um, apart from the sandy snow, you get like these mountains, hills, you also get like underwater waterfalls that are actually distinguished by not water, but sand. So you get these sandy slopes that like sort of like play a crucial role in redistributing the nutrients. Like us, we eat and we get nutrients. So these animals also need nutrients to survive in these somewhat hostile environments. So yeah, that's it from me. This is one of, uh, uh, one of the most exciting bits for me is like seeing the seabed seeing what's there, observing, and taking the time to really sort of like try and interpret, try and understand what this means. So we are out here and there's scientists all across the world who go out, uh, spend extended times away from their families because they wanna look for clues in the ocean and sort of like try and reproduce how the ocean looks like, uh, if it changes, how the change might look like, where these animals might go, because yeah, every single living organism in this world needs a home. And it's no different for the animals that you see in the deeper, darker waters of our ocean. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Fabulous, very generous offer. If you need to get in touch with me in Explore Classroom, our email is exploreclassroom at ngs.org. Well, on the outro of this event, I have quite a lot of thank yous to go through. So the first and biggest thank you, I know the students all around the world watching are echoing this with me, of course goes to Zaleka for doing this amazing work and for also taking the time to hang out with us and share it today. Your enthusiasm is absolutely infectious. You've got a lot of support from kids all around the world. Thank you. I wanna also thank our friends at the South African Department of Environment, Forestry and Fisheries and the team on board the OceanX for making this happen. It is not an easy thing to connect with people from all over the world and a vessel that is actively at sea. They did so much work to make this possible. It was a fabulous experience. Thank you to them. Thank you to our students for these questions. They were so good. Um, just fabulous, keep that curiosity. And thank you to the teachers who make cool stuff like this possible. Keep checking in with the Ocean Explorer crew, crew here on Explorer Classroom. We'll be doing more events periodically throughout their expedition. Explorer Classroom also runs a regular schedule of live events with National Geographic Explorers right here on YouTube. Every Monday at 11 a.m. Eastern time, we have an event for ages four through eight. And every Thursday at 10 and two Eastern, we have events for ages nine to 14. I hope to see you there. And remember, you can always register your student group for a shout out and a chance to be featured up here on screen at natgeoed.org slash explorer classroom. Happy Women's History Month. Have a fabulous day, a stellar weekend. Stay curious, keep exploring, and we'll see you soon. Bye everyone.